Hello everyone, this is Dr. Webb, and welcome to Episode 5, The Tower Law. Yeah, so this is probably the best uh, title that we're going to have for a video all term. Um, Tower Law sounds sounds pretty cool, sounds pretty mysterious. Um, So what are we really going to be talking about today? So the focus of today is really we're going to be thinking about extensions of extensions. And so the setup is we have three fields, F, K, and L. F is inside of K, K is inside of L, and for our purposes, we're going to have these both be finite extensions. So K over F is finite, and L over K are finite. So as an example of this, you can think maybe start F be the rational numbers, um, then K could be Q adjoined the square root of 2, and then L could be tack on the square root of 3 onto that as well. And so when we say q adjoined square root of 2 and square root of 3, you can kind of think about it as taking q adjoined square root of 3 and adding on as q adjoined square root of 2 and adding on the square root of 3. So in this setup, uh, k is a finite dimensional vector space over f because it is a finite extension. And you can also think about L as a finite dimensional vector space over K. So what does that mean? Well, that means that for K over F, we have a basis of elements in K, and we'll call this gamma 1 through gamma n. And so everything in K can be written as a linear combination of these basis elements with coefficients from F. Similarly, for L, we have this basis of elements lambda 1 through lambda n. So everything in L can be written as a linear combination of lambda 1 through lambda n using coefficients from k, from that bigger field k. And let's make this a little bit smaller. Yeah. So to get things in L, we can use lambda 1 through lambda n writing things in K, but then for everything in K, we can write it using gamma 1 through gamma n using uh, coefficients from F. And so the question here is what then can we say about L over F? Right? What can we say about this extension here? And this really is answered in this lemma right here. And it says let F, K, and L be fields, just as we, we had it set up, uh, with the bases, just as we, we had set up. So we have gamma 1 through gamma M is a basis for K over F. Lambda 1 through lambda N is a basis for L over K. Well, then, to get a basis for L over F, all we need to do is just multiply, take all the different combinations of multiplying uh, the two different bases together. Right, so this is really talking about all the different combinations of multiplying elements of the two bases together. Right, so you take some basis element from the basis for K over F, you take some basis element for L over K, multiply them together, do that for all the different combinations, all the N times M different combinations, that's going to be your new basis. Okay, and really proving this is not very difficult at all. Right, so first we need to prove that this is a spanning set so that we can write everything in L um, uh, using elements from this basis and coefficients from F, right? So let's let alpha be in L, but then since alpha is in L, that means that we can write it in terms of lambda 1 through lambda n. So alpha is equal to a1 lambda 1, up to a n lambda n, where these a i's 
are coming from K, but then each AI is inside K, so to write the AIs, we can use the gamma one through gamma n. So we can write AI equal to, let's call it B I one gamma one plus B I M lambda M, and that should be a subscript, not a superscript. And so then that means that we can write alpha as B one one gamma one plus B one M gamma M times lambda one all the way down to B N one gamma one plus B N M gamma M times lambda N. And then when we expand that all out, and so let's clear up some space and expand that all out. Okay, now we have some more space. And expanding this all out, you can see you get B11 one, one, gamma 1 lambda 1 plus B1 M gamma M lambda 1. And then you'd have all the 1s times lambda 2, all of them times lambda 3, all the way down to B N 1 gamma 1 lambda n, and then the last one being b n m gamma m lambda n. So we have written alpha in terms of a linear combination of these basis elements from here, and all of these coefficients now, all of these b i j's are coming from f because they were used, they came from using that basis to rewrite the elements of K, okay? So this is enough to show that this is a spanning set. Now the last thing to show that, that it is uh, linearly independent, um, if we show spanning set and linear independence, that shows that it's a basis. So let's suppose that we have zero is equal to, let's use the same notation before, uh, gamma one, lambda one, all the way out to B and M gamma, uh, gamma, M lambda N. Okay, so suppose we have that. Well, so we are going to now rearrange back, basically do the same thing that we did before. And so we can rewrite this as being zero is equal to, well, B one, one, gamma one. So I'm gonna pull out all the lambda ones at the beginning plus B one M lambda M a gamma M times lambda one. So I'm factoring out all of the lambda ones together, doing that for all the lambdas down to B N one gamma one plus B N M gamma M times lambda n. So this is, now this as a whole is an element in K times lambda one. This is an element in K times lambda n. And so 
So now this is really, we're thinking about this as being an element in L over K using the basis lambda 1 through lambda N. But lambda 1 through lambda N are linearly independent. Are linearly independent. And so that means that each of these coefficients from k have to equal zero. And so that means that b i 1 gamma 1 plus b i m gamma m have to equal zero for each of these i. Right? But these are elements in K, and we've written these elements in K using this basis for K over F. And so K over F, they're linearly independent. And so the only possibility here for this to happen is if B, I, J is equal to zero for all I and all J. And so this is using the fact that both of them individually are linearly independent. And so by rearranging them properly, you can use the independent, the linear independence of each of them individually to end up with that all the coefficients the whole time have to be zero. And so the only solution to get a linear combination of these equal to zero is the trivial one, the one that, where all the coefficients are equal to zero. And that's it. That proves it. That means that we have this basis for L over F. And so that immediately tells us what the dimension of L over F is. And what's that going to be? Well, it's going to be the product of M and N. And that is Tower Law. So corollary, which is the Tower Law, is basically saying what the dimension of L over F is. So if F, K, and L are fields with F inside of K inside of L, and K over F and L over K are both finite, then the degree of the extension L over F is equal to the product of the degree of L over K and K over F, right? So you take the product of these indices and you get the index of L over F, right? And the, the way that, reason this is called a tower law is the way that we often draw the representation of these fields is we would take, we would do L on top, K underneath it, and then F on the bottom, and then the degrees of both of these are the indices. So this is talking about degree of that is K over F. The degree of this is L over K. And so then what's the degree from F to L? It's just the product of these two. So this is L F and it's equal to multiplying these two together. Okay, so let's think about an example. Um, let's go back to what we talked about at the beginning. So our base field will be Q, and then we'll adjoin 2 to that, and then we'll adjoin square root of 3 again after that. Right? And so if we're drawing this as a tower, our tower would look like this. Okay, between Q and Q adjoint square root of 2, so this is going to be degree 2 because it's a simple extension adjoining square root of 2, so it's quadratic. And our basis here, we can have B1 comma square root of 2, and this is a basis over the rational numbers. Then, to, if we're then adding square root of 3 onto there, uh, over Q adjoining square root of 2, it turns out this is also a degree two extension. And the basis here 
we can choose to be 1 and square root of 3. But remember when we're doing the coefficients for this, the coefficients for using this basis are coming from q adjoin square root of 2. So square root of 2 is inside is 1 times square root of 2. That's actually just using the basis element 1 because we're allowed to multiply by square root of 2 because that's in that field. Okay, And so then if we're thinking about what the tower law says, is that the degree of q adjoined square root of 2 and q square root of 3 over q is going to be 4. And we can get a basis just by multiplying, doing all the different combinations together. And so one basis coming out of this is going to be uh, 1, 1 times 1, and then 1 times square root of 2, and then 1 times square root of 3, and then square root of 3 times square root of 2 gives me square root of 6. And so there's my basis of four elements. Okay. And so coming from this basis here, this is really talking about that um, the minimal polynomial for square root of 3, even over q adjoined square root of 2, is still x squared minus 3. Right? We still That's still going to give us square root of 3. This, it, that doesn't have a root in square root of 2. And so this is basically how it works. And so this is if you have things broken up, um, you know, going bit by bit, adjoining one element uh, from one to the next, this gives you a way to, to come up with, if you know the bases for them individually, to come up with the overall basis. You just do all the possible products together. Okay. One big warning out of this, though, um, is that just if you're looking at this, this tower, f, k, and l, and you take something in l, the minimal polynomial for alpha over f may not be the same as its minimal polynomial over k. So changing the base field may change the minimal polynomial. So case in point, um, let's consider the element square root of 2 plus square root of 3 in q adjoined square root of 2 square root of 3. So you can check this out. Um, I'm not going to go through why this is. This is actually closely related to a homework problem. Um, but over Q, the minimal polynomial for square root of 2 plus square root of 3 is degree 4, x to the 4th, minus 10x squared plus 1. You can plug this in. You will see that square root of 2 plus square root of 3 is a root of this. So this is the minimal polynomial over Q. However, if we jump to Q adjoined square root of 2 then the minimal polynomial now is quadratic. And this is coming from the fact that we can now use square root of 2 in our coefficients. And so if you look at the minimal, poly minimal polynomial now, it's quadratic and it has a square root of 2 inside one of its coefficients, which we weren't allowed to do with Q, but now, that, now we can if we're using Q adjoined square root of 2 as, it's, as the base field. And so in fact, what's really going on here is that x to the 4th minus 10x squared plus 1 is no longer irreducible over q adjoined square root of 2. And it actually factors into two quadratics. One is the one that's listed there, which is now the new poly minimal polynomial for square root of 2 plus square root of 3. And the other one looks like this. Um, that should be an x there. And it's the same as before. It's just changing that sign right there. And so this, f this polynomial factors into x squared minus 2 square root of 2x minus 1 times x squared plus 2 square root of 2x minus 1. And this is the one this is the one that has square root of 2 plus square root of 3 as a root. The other one has two other roots uh, that are different than square root of 2 plus square root of 3. And if you wanted to look instead uh, at what happens over q adjoined square root of 3, 
Um, it also uh, is no longer irreducible there. It also factors, um, and this is one of the factors. The other factor, so in Q adjoined square root of 3, x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus 1, in fact, factors as this times x squared plus 2 square root of 3 x plus 1. And you can double check that this works out. Um, and so, you know, really kind of what's going on here is you can think that there's two different ways to get up to Q adjoin square root of 2 square root of 3. One going through square root of 2. The other going through square root of 3. But if you, if you take the product of these degrees up either way, they're going to equal. And in fact, all the all the degrees here are equal between them. These are all degree two extensions from each other. Um, and so two times two gives you four, the same as this two times two gives you four. Um, but so what this ends up meaning is that no longer, so as you go up in higher and higher extensions, um, changing your base fields, changing from Q to something higher up, um, it is quite likely that uh, the minimal polynomials for these elements will change as well through this. That is all for this video. I think it's been a pretty short one. I will see you again soon.